Brothers and sisters, I do not consider that I have made it my own yet. It's interesting. I don't think I've made it yet. But one thing I do, forgetting what lies behind and reaching forward to what lies ahead, I press on towards the goal to win the heavenly prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. That's good stuff. Literally, that thought, I've got all the credentials, but man, I just, there is a bunch of stuff I ain't got right. Now listen, I'm amazed at how many Christians I meet that even when you know they're not squared away, will look you in the eye and act like they're squared away. You can usually tell if they're the ones gossiping. Yeah? If you're good to gossip, you got a spiritual problem. No, nope, flat out, straight up. Listen, I have had, I've been here 17 years and I've had a lot of board members, so nobody's going to know who told me this. But I have board members tell me when, I, when something secret comes in the board meeting, I've had board members look at me and say, well, now listen, because I, I don't come between a man and his wife. I never have. I think it's a bad position to put someone in, okay? So I always tell my board members, you share what you feel like you need to or you should, okay? I'm not, I'm not your, I'm, I'm not, I'm just not doing that to a marriage. I'm not doing that. And I've had at least three different board members over the years say, mm, there's a lot of things I haven't told my wife because I don't want everybody else to know. Now listen to what I'm saying. The last person that told me that said, now, she's a great woman. She just doesn't know how to shut up. Are you listening? Listen to me. That's not a bad habit. That's a spiritual problem. Are you listening? The Bible talks about it all through the New Testament especially, over and over and over and over and over again. You've heard me preach it. The same hell that waits for the homosexual, waits for the gossiper, the liar, and the backbiter. Same one. You better listen. It's dangerous. It's not a bad habit. It's dangerous. It's a spiritual problem. And I'm going to let you ladies off the hook because I'm telling you right now, I know a lot of men, and some of them, every bit of bad or worse. Thank you, Mom. I, I got out. You, you did good. I appreciate your help. The rest of the ladies are sitting by their husbands, and they're afraid to, to clap right now. That's right. That's all right. Amen. The problem... <laughs> It is an equal opportunity sin. Cross the board, men and women both. Amen? It's true. Now, I don't know how I got off on that, but we're going into something. Just hang on. Let me switch gears a little bit. You guys are getting really quiet. It's better that way. Joyce Meyer said one time, I heard somebody, or I heard to make the statement. She said, uh, she said, what? What was the greatest day in your life? And she said, you know, most people think uh, the day I got married or the day my first child was born or whatever. And she said, all of those are great days, but the greatest day of your life is today. And I'm going to take that just a little further because the question was framed just a little wrong. What was the greatest day in your life? What was the greatest day in your life the day you decided to follow Jesus? That was the greatest day in your life. It always will be. It's never going to change. That was the greatest day of your life. Amen? From that, it depends on who you are. For me, I would tell you the second greatest day of my life is the day that I met her. Because everything that I've, listen, she's my blessing, but every if I look at my life, my ministry, my children, all my earthly blessings are because I made that decision. All right? But first, I made the decision to follow Jesus with her. Are you with me? Amen. So those, those are true. So what was your greatest day depends on who you are. Everybody's got the first one. After that, I don't know. But if I change the question and, says what, and say what is the greatest day of your life, that's today. Why? Because today I decide if I'm going to keep doing what I decided to do when I said I'm going to follow Jesus. 
Amen. Today I decide whether I'm going to continue to be her husband or her father or my grandchildren's granddad. Today I decide. Every day I get up, I decide whether or not I'm going to be the man God called me to be, whether or not I'm going to do ministry like God called me to do it, whether or not I'm going to be the husband, father, whatever it is, God, today, every day. And tomorrow, when tomorrow becomes today, tomorrow will be the greatest day of my life. Amen. So listen, it, this, this is what Paul's trying to tell you. This one thing I do he said, I leave behind. And if you're not careful, it sounds like I'm saying, well, I'm just going to leave unresolved issues in my past and I'm going to move on. But that's not what he says. He says, forgetting those things that are behind, if you look up that word, what he's saying is not allowing them to hold me back to where I was. Now listen, I may, just moving on may resolve some of those issues. Just saying I just choose to step out of this and go on with my future that God's called me to, that may resolve some of those issues. But if they don't, you need to look at the devil and say, listen, devil, if I don't have this resolved yet, I'm not staying back there forever until I get it resolved. We can resolve it as we're going into the future that God has asked me to do. I remember years ago, and this is going to sound tough, it wasn't. I'm glad he didn't call me on it and beat my head in. But I was standing at the door with an Arkansas, line, Arkansas University linebacker standing at the door, he's a big old dude. I wanted in. I didn't have an invitation. And I said, knocked on the door. He opens the door, and he's looking like this. And he said, what do you, what do you need? And I said, I, we want in. And he said, do you have an invitation? Nope, but I want in. And he said, well, you can't come in here. This is an exclusive. And it was. It was for the football team, cheerleaders. and they're, they're, That wasn't my crew in college. That wasn't who I was with. And I remember thinking, at 19 years old, I'm coming in. I'm coming through you, over you, around you, under you. I don't know how, I don't care how I have to do it. I'm coming in. So I opened my mouth, and I looked at, stupid. Listen, all y'all, 19 years old, do not take this advice. You see these little things on television that say, do not try this at home? Don't. Try this. This is bad, bad, bad thinking. It's a bad way to do it. And I looked at him and I said, I'm coming in without an invitation. I'm either going to come through you, I'm coming over you, I'm coming around you, but I'm coming in. He stepped like that and let me in. If he'd have called my bluff, there ain't a way in the world I'd have got through him. Not a chance on earth. He could have just went... Weighed 300 pounds, and I didn't see any fat on him. Are you listening? Now, that's stupidity in the natural because I don't have anything to back it up with. But your Bible says if God be for you, who can be against you? So it doesn't matter how big the devil looks like at the door. You can look at him and say, listen to me. That's my future around there. So I'm coming through you. I'm coming around you. I'm coming over you. I'm coming under you. I don't care how I got to get through there, but I'm coming, honey. I'm headed that way. You better get out of my way, devil. God said I could have it. I'm going to have it. Your attitude with the enemy, listen, we have, as Christians, we have placated him forever. All he's got to do is roar, and we shrink back like something we can't. Listen, and I understand it because I, growing up the way I did, uh, uh, how do I say this? Being humble is, was so drilled into your head that at some point you became so humble you couldn't do anything. Everything. I remember when they first asked me to sing on stage, I wouldn't do it. Why? Because the devil in my head said, well, they're, you're gonna, they're going to think you're trying to be somebody. In a 20-year-old mind, I didn't know what to do with that. At 56, I'd say, I am somebody. I'm not trying to be, I am. Not because I am, but because he is. That's what he said. 
Amen? My righteousness is just filthy rags, but because he has made me righteous, his righteousness means I can do all things through Christ Jesus who strengthens me. I'm who he says I am, not who you say I am, not who the devil says I am. I'm who he says I am. But I didn't know what to do with it. So you got to be careful. I, and I listen, I believe in humbleness. The second you step anywhere on stage, grab a microphone, or just step up in, or stand up in front of a group of people or even a friend or two and take the glory from God, honey, you're in trouble. Don't do it. And there's lots of ways to do it. It doesn't matter if somebody keeps saying, I give the glory to God, I give the glory of God, I give the glory of God, but then constantly trying to get you to give them compliments. It doesn't matter what they say. It matters how they act. Are you listening? Pay attention. Some of the most egregious glory robbers are those that constantly post, I'm just giving the glory all to God. Somebody comment here and tell me how good I am. Ooh, won't that make you mad? I have figured out something. Now, I'll come to the pulpit and say to God, be the glory, great things he's done, because that's a word that I use. It's the word of God that I use. But I don't have to run around telling you all the time I'm giving God the glory. You'll know whether or not I'm giving God the glory. Right? All right, let's go back. So Paul says, I'm not going to stay there with that. I'm not. I leave these things, and I press forward. I go I go ahead, I press forward. Now, I got my Bible out a few weeks ago when I was building this, and I said, God, well, what is it that holds me? What keeps, what stops me from moving? Why don't I go? And he just starts giving me a list of things. Fear, doubt, unbelief, shame, guilt, regret. And some of these things start hitting me. I'm like, oh, yeah, that's, wow, ouch. That's me. Because you don't really think about why you don't move forward. You just don't move forward. Right? So I just started jotting them down. Weeks ago, I started, I'd put down this one and that one or whatever. And over the weeks, I'd let God give me scripture for it. Now, I have a lot of them. Can't cover them all this morning. Not even going to try it. It's 12.09. Some of y'all think you're... Your stomach thinks your throat's been cut already, so. But I'm going to get a couple of them out of here. Shame. Brother, do you have that scripture I have? I sent it to you. Somebody described guilt and shame like a loop one time, and, I, and it just really stuck with me because that's what it's like. <laughs> uh Years ago, I discovered we. I like to sleep with a fan on. I like white noise. Okay, I, if I can hear a pin drop, I can hear a pin drop. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> and it'll drop, and I'm up. Sister Karen, I promise you, go right out there when you guys are all leaving. She can lay right out there in the middle of that road, and all of you just drive around her. She'll go right to sleep. It's infuriating. I have literally had her roll over in bed kiss me on the lips and with her lips against mine go it's a testament to either how well she sleeps or how boring I am I don't know not me I got to have the fan rolling and I and nothing else one white noise not five of them to get my mind what's that just good. We traveled. We, I, you know, especially when you're traveling in a truck or a car. We didn't have a box fan with us to carry into the hotel. So I discovered on my phone there's literally a box fan on my phone. This, listen, this was revelatory news to me. I didn't know, and I loved it. So I pulled it up. It's an hour long. So I just went. I made a playlist. Loop and loop and loop and loop and loop, and that goes like 14 hours of just solid fan. Never runs out. I push play, plug it in so it doesn't die. It's glorious. 
Amen. And then when Sister Karen starts snoring, I turn it up louder. Oh, you think I'm kidding? It's great. I love it. Works well for sleeping. It doesn't work so well if it's guilt or shame on a loop. Over and over and over and over again. A couple of weeks ago, I shared with you about being afraid one night about Braden being gone, being afraid when he was a little boy, the enemy would mess with me because of my past, Karen's past, all, both that we didn't deserve a child. So they, the enemy would say, I'm taking him away from you. You did, you sinned when you were younger. I'm taking away from you. I'm taking you away from you now. Well, early on, I was a really young Christian and I didn't know he didn't have that kind of authority, but so it was it was frightening at the time. And how he did that was this guilt, the shame of how I'd lived my life when I knew better was on a loop. I'd do things in my life and I'd turn it off. I'd go on down the road, live sometimes days, weeks, never think anything about it. And then something would happen somewhere, the devil would trigger and he'd push play again. And it just leaks. That's what Paul sits talking about here when he said, These, I'd leave those things behind me. And I press, I press forward. I press into my future. Do you understand the wording there? Not, this is easy, I just, I'm done, I'm done with that, let's go. For me, it has this air about it that there's wind, like a like wind pushing against you. I press forward. If you're looking for easy, you've picked the wrong God. There's some out there that will give you easy for a season, and then you'll pay for it forever, all right? This God is going to require require some fight for a while so you can get to peace forever. Now, let me read this passage to you. Would you put that back up there? I'm sorry, brother. Had you. Fear not, for thou shalt not be ashamed. Neither be you confounded, for thou shalt not be put to shame. For the thou shalt forget the shame of your youth, and shalt not remember the repro- reproach of thy widowhood. Now, wait, what does that have to do with us today? How you do you apply that? Obviously, the shame of your youth makes perfect sense. How many of y'all were geniuses at 18? Okay, get over here, Joy. I'm praying for you right now, baby. I know you now. You forget what you do. Lose it. Gotcha. We, everybody, all of us, were pretty good at not being too good when we were younger. Even those who served God still made some pretty dumb mistakes, right? And unfortunately, a bunch of us didn't serve God. So we didn't just make mistakes. We made monumental mistakes. You guys up there, (laughs) I've lost them. (laughs) There's, There's guilt and shame all kinds of stuff attached to bad decisions from the past. And especially if it shows up in the life you live today, right? That makes it even tougher because the devil uses it. Oh, remember what you do. Remember when you, listen, thank God we have a God that says, I put them as far as the east is from the west, never to be remembered against you anymore. Amen? That's your God. Now, 
the widowhood part in this, what is the spiritual application of that? And they can literally mean that. But the spiritual application is you will not remember the shame from what you lost. That's what the word widowhood here means, literally. The word technically is loss of a spouse, but it means you're lost from way back then. So whatever you lost, whether it was a spouse or bad business decision, whatever, God says, I'll restore to you and make you forget what you lost. Amen? Oh, I'm going to go, do one more. You're glad about that. I got eight. And one more. I will do all of them, Lord willing. Six more next week, maybe. We'll see. Probably not. I'm guessing not. But I want to read Isaiah before I move on. I'm sorry. I just dropped it. Greg, you know when we pour out corn, you get corn in your boot? I don't know, dude. I got corn in this boot. I don't know what's happening. Something. Isaiah chapter 61, verse 7. I like this. For your shame you shall have have double. And for confusion they shall rejoice in their portion. Therefore in their land they shall possess the double. Everlasting joy shall be unto them. There are all kinds of promises in the word of God about what the enemy does to you and what he has to do when he's found out. Amen? All kinds of promises. There's a place in there that says you catch a thief, you return sevenfold. So if the devil stole from you, get ready. Amen? I like sevenfold. Seven times more than I had is better than what I had. Even where I went to school, I can do that math. Amen? If shame was hard, if the guilt was is was hard, if it all was tough, but God's going to give me double blessing for the shame that I went. Twice as hard as the shame was is going to be the blessing that God says he will bring to you. Honey, you need to understand your God is a multiplication God. Amen. God does not make things even. God puts you over the top. Amen. This is why getting back with your, to your enemies is not good. Getting even with your enemies, why would you want to be even? If you'll let God do it, it'll be better than even. Amen? Don't get even. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. That's why he said it, because I'm better at it than you are. Oh, boy, that's hard to convince some folks. Amen? I, I've got to go. I've got to go. I've got to, I've got to go. Guilt. Let me just read the word and I'll, and I'll, I'll get out of here. John three seventeen. You ought to know this. Y'all have it memorized. For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but through the but the world through Him might be saved. The word condemned there is condemnation, guilt. Amen. Jesus came to make sure you didn't have any. The second you feel guilt, it isn't God convicting you. It's the devil messing with you. God doesn't send guilt. He sends conviction, and that's different. Conviction will draw you to God, will always bring you to, Lord, I forgive me. Guilt will push you away. Guilt will stop you from talking. Are you listening? Let me, let me keep reading. The Word says it better than I do. It's not God's promise, or it's not God's promises to condemn, promise purposes to condemn you. It's His desire to take away your sin, to keep you from sin, and to save you through Jesus Christ. Now, watch this. I, I, I wrote that down because one of the most confusing things I've ever dealt with in individuals trying to come to Christ is the difference between conviction and guilt. Everybody knows deep down they're supposed to feel bad about doing things that are bad. Is that right? I mean, if you don't, something's wrong with you. Those are psychopaths. 
narcissist and serial killers. <laughs> if you don't feel bad about doing things bad, something's wrong with you, right? Now, there are individuals, I've known a few, even had a few work for me, I think, but I've known a few who, <laughs> you're okay, Mike, where'd you go? I was, he's already left. <laughs> who just never done anything. No matter what you bring up, no matter how bad the wreck they caused was, when you show them the wreck, Whoa, I didn't I do that, right? That's a personality disorder, right? I'm talking about spirituality here. We know instinctively that when we do bad things, we're supposed to feel bad about them, right? That's natural. What's not, not natural is to carry that into depression, carry that into an unwillingness to change, to carry that. In. It's like, and I'm not going to preach on this, but it's like the Bible telling you to be, it says, be angry without sinning. Well, how do you do that? Right? These are tough. These are, these are emotions God gave you. You're supposed to have them in the right portion at the right place at the right time. And the minute the enemy gets to move them into some other area of your life or compound them to make them into something else, that's when you're in trouble. So steering your emotions going forward is always an incredibly difficult task. Amen? Now watch. Um, brother, skip, go to... Second uh, Corinthians five one, five twenty one. Sorry, that's it. For he hath made him to be sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be made righteousness of God in him. This is simple. Do I feel bad when I do bad things? You better. Do I walk around with that guilt? No. It's almost like looking at him and saying what you did wasn't enough. You just keep carrying it into your future. If you just can't release it, you can't get rid of it, then you're literally saying, Jesus, your sacrifice was not enough. It was enough. You have no penance left to do. There are religions that teach the blood doesn't go far enough, so you go say whatever, read whatever, pray whatever. None of that's true. There is one mediator between God and man. His name is Jesus. When you go to that mediator, you have no further steps to take. You don't have to do anything for anybody. You don't have to be anything for anybody. You don't have to repeat any prayers or say any things or rub any beads. All you have to do is go to that mediator and say, Lord, I have sinned against you. I am sorry. Please forgive me. And guess what? The way it works is he forgives you. Well, it can't be that simple. Well, if it isn't, all of y'all and me included, I'm going to be the one in front of the parade. We're all going to hell if it ain't that simple because I promise you, you ain't never going to be good enough for heaven. He's only good enough for heaven. Amen? So he is the one we put our trust in. 